Exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. Her mission to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose to be your personal advocate to live, love, laugh, learn. Her life motto don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Fay on UBNRadio.com. here in Hollywood, California. And a big shout out to the fabulous security team here, Jackson, Washington, and all the gang. And, uh, and the best valet service as well to the guys upstairs on the fifth floor. All right, so I'm here with my cute station manager as well, Tony Sweet, and my sensational sound engineer, Christian Guerrera. And for those of you, you missed your whistle. <laughs> there we go. And for those of you who are tuning into the show for the first time, this is a show about hope and how you can put your life jacket on with a silver lining and choose happiness. I cover topics and bring guests on to help you be happy 88% of the time. And so on the show, there's no CNN, constantly negative news, no gossip, no scandal, and no K words, no Kardashian talk. <laughs> And it's the last Tuesday of the month. So guess what we're talking about? Here's the hint. <laughs> That's right. It's time for my newest series that launched last month, the last Tuesday of every month. Sexual healing, because it's one of the areas that can make you very happy or very unhappy. It's sex. If you've missed any of my sizzling hot sex sh boot shows with Booty Calls with Dr. Pat Allen, G-Spots with Dr. Robin Milhausen, and Orgasms with Justine Dawson, go to YouTube and iTunes for free downloads and give me a finger while you're at it. <laughs> I mean a thumbs up and a great review. So let me introduce my co-host for this series. Dr. Robin is a popular TV personality from her role as host on one of Life Network's past top rated shows, Sex, Toys and Chocolate, as well as featured on Sex Education Correspondent on Three Takes and Revamped. On the academic side, Dr. Milhausen is a University of Guelph professor where her research focuses on gender and sexuality, desire, sexual problems and arousal. She is a respected leader on sexual education and relationships and currently on a speaking tour of Canadian University and colleges sponsored by Trojan talking about sexual pleasure and sexual health. Please welcome Dr. Robin Milhausen. Hello, nice to be back. It's so good to have you back. How has your month been? Oh, you know, it, it flies by all this sex research just keeps a girl busy. <laughs> you keep coming back for more and more, huh? <laughs> <laughs> So our question of the week this uh, week for this series is how do we get better sex or how do we ask for better sex in the bedroom or actually any room in the house or out of the house? But keep me straight here. Dr. Robin, how do we do that? Well, I think the first thing and the most important thing is figure out the kind of sex you want because we can't just expect, you know, if you walked into a restaurant and sat down, you wouldn't expect the waitress to bring you exactly the food you wanted if you didn't order. Mm. So you need to figure out what you want to order and then you need to order it in an <laughs> appropriate way. Um, so the very first step is, yes, figuring out what kind of sex you want. And uh, a very famous Canadian sex therapist, Piggy Kleinblatt, once said that if she was having the kind of sex that most other people were, were having, she wouldn't have any interest in sex 
at all either. So she's saying that one of the big causes of low sexual desire is just the fact that people are having uninteresting sex. And mm. if we all had better sex, we would want to have more of it. Good so point. I think that's the very first thing, figuring out what kind of sex would motivate you to have sex. And then you can figure out how you're going to go about creating that kind of sex in your relationship. But until you know what you're looking for, you're just going to be feeling around in the dark um, rather than creating something in a purposeful way. Okay. So, but how do you know what kind of sex you want? I mean, I know my first time was, (laughs) believe me, if that's what sex was, I would still have just one experience so how do you know what good sex is because some well, I, of this- yeah I would encourage people to either reflect back on their own experiences and think about what was a time that was really great I mean what, when was their desire really high when was their arousal really high was it in a new relationship with a new partner was it in a really romantic setting was it in kind of a risky setting where someone might walk in if you kind of go through your mental Uh, Rolodex of sexual encounters, you can get a sense of what things really worked for you. Mm -hmm. If you haven't had many encounters, you know, there's tons of sexually explicit content on the internet that that you could watch to get a sense of what you're interested in, and a lot of it's available for free. If you're interested in maybe, you know, dialing it back a little bit, you could read, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey or some other romantic or erotic fiction to kind of get an idea. Okay. Um, all right. There's, there are lots of ways so that's to try and the figure menu. out what things turn you on. So those are sources for menu, uh, mm-hmm. reading, porn. Um, and I want to come back to porn in a second. I didn't think we were going to talk about it today, but it seems like that is the segue. But um, before we go there, mm-hmm. if, if you had really, really good sex with someone uh, that you cared about, mm-hmm. isn't that... A key ingredient though how can you replicate that great sex with someone that you you know you just meet or you're not that crazy is it possible to get what you want outside if I go use your prescription and I go back to where you know it was good how do I can I get that same without that same partner or with a different partner how, how does that work it depends what other ingredients, you know, are, to keep going with the restaurant analogy, are present. Okay. So maybe the love was one ingredient, but also it was a romantic setting and it was a time of your life when you were more carefree, when before you had kids or before you had a really stressful mm-hmm. job. So if you can figure out what was the whole constellation of factors that led to that being great sex, maybe that partner's no longer around, but you can still create the other elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. in your current sexual relationship. It could be harder if for you, intimacy Literally. and connection in the long-term relationship is really the thing, and now you don't have that partnership. Um, that can be hard. And then maybe we might advise that person to fantasize back on that mm-hmm. encounter by themselves with a vibrator or, or some other kind of sex toy. So if they can't actually get the person back, they may have to live with it in their fantasy world until they create another kind of long-term mm-hmm. intimate relationship so so it's okay to use help like vibrators for sure okay. uh, and I think if, if we're talking about heterosexual relationships if you've got a partner mm-hmm. the body parts just don't actually line up perfectly for orgasm for women in, in many cases so they do line up for procreation pretty well but not necessarily for orgasm so oftentimes we need help to stimulate the right places for us um, and that doesn't happen during regular sex. I'm putting regular in quotation marks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And 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 for those of you who've just tuned in and think you have on the wrong channel, yes, you are listening to uh, Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get Balanced with Dr. Marissa. We are talking about sex. We are talking about it very openly because we don't talk about it very openly. And as a result, we aren't getting the sex that we could or we aren't getting the pleasure that we could in the bedroom, which is why I'm doing this series and which is why I have an expert like Dr. Robin co-hosting with me because she does this for a living. She's very comfortable, obviously, with talking about it. And I think that when we begin to not blush or not turn away and not um, uh, refuse to talk about it is when pleasure becomes an important and uh, wonderful gift that it's meant to be in this lifetime. So that's why we're talking about it. Now, if I do my thing, (laughs) which I'm known for, which is to live my life or love my life out loud, 
And I go back to what you said about recreating the best sex that I ever had. And it was with someone that I care deeply about. And I don't, they, you know, we're not compatible, so we're not together again. If I practice your uh, recipe right now and I go back, I think the key reason why the sex was so good was he made me feel so beautiful and so um, uh, uh I was comfortable in my own skin. I didn't, I wasn't in my head about, oh, you know, the, 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 the fat here or the, you know, have I, you know, prepared well or do I look, do I look beautiful? Do I look sexy? And, and so I think I could do that on my own by not, well, yeah, on my own, if I could recreate that feeling without him, like, do I see myself the way he saw me? Can I see myself the way we saw me? And I think we talked on uh, one or two shows ago about the things that get in our way of pleasure. Uh, for women, largely, it's, you know, our distractibility or what's on our mind or what we're thinking about that takes away from our ability to feel uh, good or orgasmic for that matter. So, Absolutely. yeah. So, so would you, would you agree that that's something I should practice or look into or try? Absolutely. And I think we all have a responsibility okay, huh? uh, to, to put ourselves in the right headspace for a sexual encounter, you know, so it's worth it for our partner. They deserve to have that kind of sex with a really present partner. And mm -hmm. we deserve to have that experience as a really present, excited, aroused partner. Mm -hmm. And if you know, those conditions are, are ones that are important for you. I think we should all take the time and effort because sexuality, our sexual lives and our partner's sexual pleasure are important enough to warrant us attending to those things and creating those conditions. Mm -hmm. and I, it, it's easier to crawl into bed in the old t-shirt, but you don't feel that hot in the old t-shirt. So right. we should take an extra six minutes, maybe brush our hair, brush our teeth, put on something a little slinky. Mm. And we'll feel sexy and our partner will appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's, a great, that's a great point. So actually factoring it in to our schedule. So it is an important part of uh, a practice. So if we meditate in the morning, this could be a kind of meditation at mm -hmm. night or a kind of meditation in the morning, depending on when you do it. But to, right. to actually prepare for it, to say, yeah. this is, you know, we're going to, so in line with our question, an answer would be, how do we talk, how do we get better sex? We could say, um, honey, uh, how about tonight at 8 p.m. we do a little exploratory uh, sex to see if we're actually having the best sex we actually could have. And most people would be pretty excited to get that text message. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on a text. <laughs> that would be, that would be, yeah, make sure you don't read that while you're driving. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, and well, that brings me to a point. So if we're trying to figure out how to, how to get the best sex, mm -hmm. um, usually our partners are motivated to help us have the best possible sex we could have because usually our partners would like to have more sex. And so actually we're in a good position to have the exact kind of sex we want because our partners will be motivated to make that happen so they can have sex more often. So it's win-win for everybody. If mm -hmm. I figure out what kind of sex I like and I can communicate it to my partner, I'm more likely to have the kind of sex I want and my partner's more likely to have sex at the frequency mm -hmm. he or she wants to have it. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so there is a, a, a meeting of the mind and the mm -hmm. body. Yes. so to speak, on this thing called sex, which is a healthy, yeah. healthy activity. And, and uh, t what are the health benefits of great sex? Oh, there are many that are physical, <laughs> psychological, emotional. Um, certainly it can help boost your immune system, increase your pain tolerance, at least in the very immediate time after having an orgasm. Um, there are all kinds of, sort of idiosyncratic seeming benefits. Mm -hmm. I am swishing with semen. There's a lot of good minerals in there that can help prevent tooth decay. <laughs> so there's a lot of funny so benefits. Very, very uh, the wide. And, and still, and, and I'll come back to come back to the fact around tiredness. And I think uh, many of my listeners are 
high achieving oriented, successful, um, mm. a recovering workaholic, recovering control freak women. And so, you know, we were, we're inspired by achieving and, you know, you can hear me in this. We're inspired by what we can accomplish. We're, I, we juice our life. It's a constant. Uh, I'm sure you're the same way, Dr. Robin, mm -hmm. like the full. It's just a packed menu of activity all day. And to fit something like great sex in there is difficult to. Yeah, and it, it seems daunting. It does. But I think the, the thing is, these same type of women that, and maybe and men as well that you're co referring to, we we tend to put ourselves last because we're thinking about all of those other responsibilities and the relationships we have to take care of. But because of the health benefits of sex and the relationship benefits, I mean, sex is a glue that can hold a partnership together mm -hmm. through difficult times. And so make, making sure you have regular sexual contact can save your relationship as you go through rocky periods. And we have to not put ourselves in our relationship at the bottom of our to-do list, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but make it a priority because you can only coast for so long right. taking money out of that bank instead of putting money into it. Right, right. So let's go back to porn. Um, <laughs> there, okay, so I've actually had some people email and it's like, uh, what, is, what is your stance on porn? Um, so if I, if I do my balance thing, so on one side, there's uh, largely religious, you know, porn is bad, porn is wrong, uh, it exploits kids, uh, pedophiles, uh, dark, you know, sadistic, the whole bondage, it's bad, it leads to um, sex crimes, uh, so it should be banned, so that's one end. The other side is uh, it is uh, healthy, uh, consenting adults. Um, it is uh, a way to get turned on. It is something that is necessary to get turned on, and we want uh, the ability to access it. I know that this is going to date me, but the, when we took our first class uh, with the internet, and you know, they said type in any uh, search terms. The first, the first thing that went in was sex. I mean, almost mm -hmm. everybody in the class. Would. So, so the curiosity is there. The porn is obviously there. It's a huge industry. I don't have the numbers. I meant to look that up, but um, I didn't think we were going to talk about it today. But it so you know, there's that whole other end of no. It's a good thing. It's 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 people being happy with their bodies and happy with this thing called sex and and the and the um, the pleasure that comes from it. So where where is the middle ground? Where is the um, what's your stance on it? Porn. Yeah. Well, um, actually, there's going to be a really great presentation on this at the Guelph Sexuality Conference happening this June. A team of researchers from Canadian lead, from Canada, leading Canadian researchers, are going to be presenting an hour and a half workshop just summarizing the literature on mm. pornography use in romantic relationships. And uh, these researchers, um, Bill Fisher from the University of Western Ontario and his team, um, have said that the the research on pornography is well it's limited and it's kind of skewed towards problems um sex addiction Not kind surprising. of literature and mm -hmm. it focuses largely on problematic use and we actually there's a lot less known about you know healthy pornography use in couples that contributes in positive ways to relationships mm -hmm. so the research is negatively focused and then the media really picks up on the negative aspects yes. um, and so more research is needed on how this functions in regular healthy happy relationships but I think there are lots of ways it can be used and I think we're lucky now with the state of pornography there's far more varied pornography available there's far more actual real life couples posting videos of themselves online I think there's a a uh, website called Make Love Not Porn, where you can see actual huh. couples post posting videos of themselves. There's you porn. There are lots of these videos. Mm -hmm. um, 
with real people. You don't have to go to a store that may be shady or intimidating and purchase a DVD off the mm-hmm. shelf. Mm-hmm. You can find what you might both be interested in. It'll be free, whereas in the past it used to be quite expensive. So all this amateur stuff is really free. You could sit down with a glass of wine or a beer and your partner and just scroll through you porn, finding out things that you both might like. Mm-hmm. Um, so so let me... We, there, there are ways to use it in ways that can enhance your relationship. Okay, so so the the part that's the dark side there is definitely you know we don't i am not saying we are not saying that the part that does involve the dark side mm. of the children and um uh, sex trafficking human trafficking you know let let me be very very clear i'm not saying that that is okay in any sense of the word but it does seem like there might be a a, a benefit or a beneficial use for some porn for the the whole getting better sex in the bedroom yep so I think so for, I think for sure and I think a lot of women in particular are intimidated by the idea of pornography mm-hmm. um, and it's a bit scary to me too thinking like what is my husband doing late at night on the computer um, what I, I almost don't want to know but in, right. I think in other ways I, I would rather be a part of what he's doing than have him go down that rabbit hole by himself. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me put the moose on the table on that one. One is, it, you know, for women that say, why, why would my husband need to look at other women to get turned on? Shouldn't I mm-hmm. be enough? Shouldn't I be the one that turns him on? Okay, so that's one. Yeah. And, yeah. and two, I have heard studies that the men who are sexual, well, this is probably the sexual addict, the extreme side, that's not good, um, that if they are constantly only ma- uh, masturbating and uh, uh, having orgasms through mm-hmm. porn, then they lose interest because now they have this unreal sense of a woman's body and the porn stars and what they're supposed to look like. I can't believe I'm talking about this on the air, <laughs> but um, I'm glad. So, yeah. so you know, what, right. what about that? Yeah. What about that? No, you're, you're totally right that uh, this can slip, it can slip into problematic use and it can have real negative impacts on relationships. But... I mean, everything in moderation, like right. like you say. Right. And I think women, it would be good for women to be a little less afraid of what might happen and be mm. and open up to venturing down that road together. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the first about the first question you said, shouldn't our husbands be or partners be attracted to us? True, but but visual stimulation is appealing, you know, for, for all of us. We see a romantic movie or we read Fifty Shades of Grey, our bodies get turned on and mm-hmm. it just adds another item to the menu of choices of things we can use to enhance our arousal. Most right. men do fantasize. Most people do fantasize about their partners and they reflect back on really exciting times they've mm-hmm. had with their partners. Mm-hmm. But we all, and actually women quite commonly fantasize about people other than their husbands or boyfriends um, during <laughs> sex and masturbation. So women are just as guilty of it. Right, right. Um, we have a caller that uh, has joined us and uh, I guess we'll get a little applause. I think it's Colette. Colette, welcome Hi. to the show. Hi. Thank you for uh, visiting and asking your question to Dr. Robin and Dr. Marissa today on sexual healing. Hi, how are you? Thank you. I'm for- happy. Thank you. Good to have you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question. Uh, I... Have uh, I see clients who uh, for relationships and dating? Great. And I'm a I'm a relationship coach, and I have been struggling with this in my personal life, and it's something that I haven't been able to really help people with. And um, the question is, why is it so hard to talk about sex when it comes to you know? talking about sex with your your significant other with your with your partner um your, or your insignificant other as i say when i'm feeling bitter no <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so so the question is why is it so difficult to talk about sex great great question <laughs> yeah yeah and 
And I think it's hard it's hard for us to talk about it in a lot of contexts, not just with our partners, um, because the values we hold about our sexuality are so close to our hearts. They've been ingrained through years of childhood and adolescence. We feel really strongly about it, and we're all very vulnerable when it comes to sexuality. So if we hear from our partner that they don't like something that we're doing, it can be threatening, or they'd mm-hmm. like to do something that we haven't done yet, that uh, you might think, well, what's wrong with our current sex? So there are a lot of ways for us to be vulnerable and hurt when we talk about sex because of how how closely held those values and beliefs are. Well, I don't think anybody likes to be criticized about anything, but no. specifically about something so close to home yeah. and bad. So yeah, that would totally make sense. Um, what would you what would you advise, Dr. Robin, for um, Colette, who actually works with couples? What is the name of your business, by the way? Uh, Finding Happily Holistic Love Coaching. Ooh, I like that. And they can yeah. find you online. Yes, at findinghappily.com. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Thank you. so what? Um, so, what would be some what would be some value add uh, prizes that you could offer your clients, um, Doctor Doctor Robin? What would you tell her to to how would you open that? Mm-hmm. Well, I would say it would start with you and your own attitudes and comfort with sexuality because you find if you become a per- if you're a person who's open about sexuality um, and positive about it, you attract other people who, uh, like flies who have similar <laughs> concerns or passions or interests. And I'm sure, Dr. Marissa, since you started doing this show and focusing on sexuality, people all over at the bank and at cocktail parties want to talk to you about sex oh, yes. because you've put out you've put out there that you're an interested and open person who who has an open mind and is non-judgmental. So yes. I think the first step is you um, opening up the door, like to communicate in some way that that you're open to to talking and having sexual conversations. And and if you're not quite there yet, getting extra training and professional development, um, there's something called a sexual attitudes reassessment weekend uh, that is available all across North America various people, various sites, where you're just exposed to all kinds of different sexual behaviors, sexual attitudes. There are panels of people who come in and talk about their sexuality. And at the end of it all, it helps you see the wide spectrum of sexualities that exist and be more comfortable. And a lot of therapists take this training so that when somebody comes in and says, well, I'm in a polyamorous relationship and I really like to practice kinky sex and especially I like to wear a dog collar and get spanked. So you don't say, that sounds horrible. Um, so you can react in an open-minded, non-surprised, non-judgmental way and say, now that's interesting, you know, how long that, how long has that been working for you kind of thing. I, I prefer those kind of calls on the phone. That way they can't see my reaction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I think I think the key thing is it starts with you. And if you open the door and show that you're willing to have this open door, um, people will be much more comfortable talking about it. Great. So- uh, Dr. Robin, some of the gentlemen that I had a discussion with a gentleman on a web series that I did where let's talk about sex. And one of the things that he said, which a lot of gentlemen wrote in to me and and talked about, was that they don't feel comfortable talking about sex with their partner. It's like asking a man to get directions on the boat. He doesn't want the directions. So how do I help these individuals when most of the women, they want to have the discussion? Yeah, well, that's totally understandable. You know, men yeah. have to, they're supposed to know everything to start with. Yeah. It's, it is challenging, and it can be more challenging sometimes for some men who may feel less verbal, who may be less interested or less feel less skilled at communicating about difficult topics of lots of sorts, not just sexuality. So I think men and women who are, are challenged by talking about sexuality may want to try... Um, some other sort of nonverbal ways, like making it kind of like uh, a game. So spending time touching your partner in exactly the way that you want to be touched and talking about this in advance or just giving them a heads up so that they can observe, oh, this is the kind of touch. This is the pace of the touch that you like. This is, a, this is how much time you like spending on, you know, my upper body versus the lower body. So we can demonstrate okay. with touch rather than saying with words. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, and that makes that's, sense. That, that's one way. And I think another thing is to t- advise them not to talk about sex in the bedroom, like not in the middle of a sexual encounter. Make sure you're in a relaxed mm. setting, um, a place where you have privacy and time. Often a glass of wine helps. Um, <laughs> and focus on the things that you really like that are going really well, because that kind of reinforcement can be really powerful. Like, mm-hmm. I really liked it when you did X, Y, and Z. That was really exciting. And then X, Y, and Z will happen more often. And maybe this a, B, and C, which you didn't mention, would be spontaneously kind of extinguished because they haven't been reinforced. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I know. That makes a lot of sense. And I know you didn't ask me, but I'm going to answer because it's taking my advice mm-hmm. that I don't use. But I think just the question, having the guy say, this is their homework, go home and say uh, to, to their partner, honey, tonight... I want to know what makes you feel good. That's it. Ooh, I like it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's their homework. That's Whether they feel like it okay. or not, just say that. That way there's no criticism. They're not being told that it didn't feel good. But if that's their initiation, and then here's the homework for women. The women have to answer that question. There's no there's no typical answer of that's okay, honey. Everything you do is great. Mm-hmm. Everything you do turns me on. <laughs> Everything's fabulous. Just keep doing bull shiitake. You know, it's mm-hmm. we have this habit of also not stepping up to the plate and giving what is being asked so for? True. You know, most women I know, they I, I coach most of the time on things like compliments. We get paid a compliment, and instead of receiving the compliment and saying, thank you, we look down and say, yeah, well, actually it was on sale, and I only paid $4 for it, or, you know, it was, oh, uh, you know, I would never usually am looked and put together, but this morning I actually washed my hair. It's like, stop. <laughs> Just say right. thank right. you. So if a guy's saying to you, honey, I want to make you feel good. Tell me what makes you feel good. Then get in your body. Do a couple meditative relaxing breaths. Get in your body and feel the touch. Feel, this is a great exercise where I actually ask people, and I try to do this myself, to go inside themselves and touch their hand on the inside. So see if you can't feel their hand from you on the inside. I do that when I get massaged. And it's the most amazing sensation. It's different than actually feeling the touch. And and it's a turn on. <laughs> I have dark skin and I'm blushing right now. Oh, okay. good. <laughs> I would say another, I think that's, that's great advice for sure. Um, I would say that... Uh, that also, um, men have a habit of asking those kinds of questions at the exact wrong time, right? When you've just got to take the kids to soccer or when you're thinking about what you're going to do for your meeting tomorrow or at 1130 at night when you're finally falling into bed. So picking, picking, the, time, picking the time is critical. Um, and maybe asking, like, would, would tonight be an okay time? I want to I want to have a great talk. And not to scare the person, right? Because if, when you, I want to talk about our relationship, could be, you might, you might worry all day what that might be about. <laughs> but but to, to really frame it in a positive way and say, when would be a good time? Like, let's, let's just talk about this. And you could even say, you know, I, I heard this on the radio today, or I, mm-hmm. I heard this from the, the coach I've been working with about some other, like, mental health or, or work issues. And they, they said that it was really important. And I think we can be... We, we could potentially be happier and more sexually fulfilled if we talked about what we liked. So let's do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I yes. have a, a last question. I advise plan sex. Is that too corny? Because I just remember when you first start dating, you sort of know when that's going to happen. So I thought, well, maybe trying to plan your sexual encounters out with your partner would work. What do you think about that? Um, planning sex? Planning the first yeah. time. I think she's... Oh, are you talking about time. planning the first time? Period. Like, even when you're in that relationship, planning sexual encounters out oh, with yeah. your partner. 
sure. Actually, I think this is great. As we were talking earlier about, if you just showed up at a restaurant and sat down and hoped someone would bring you something you might like to eat, what are the chances it's going to happen? Um, we need to order the food we want, and we need to negotiate mm-hmm. the kind of sex we want to have. And people think spontaneous sex is where it's at, but actually planful sex, purposeful sex can be a whole lot more fulfilling. It gives you time to shave your legs at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, isn't that also just even from a factual, because doesn't it take us longer to get aroused than it does men? Isn't that, was it 20 minutes versus a minute and a half? Was that what you said last time? Dr. Robin. Oh, well, admit, yeah, men can eject, or adolescent boys can uh, masturbate to orgasm in a minute and a half. Less yes, kids. that's fast. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and it gives us something to kind of ruminate about all day and to look forward to. Um, so I think definitely planning sex is, is a great idea. And mm-hmm. you can alternate taking turns. There's a great book called The Great American Sex Diet, which I love, mm. um, even from Canada. And it uh, focuses <laughs> on having partners each take a turn in planning a sexual encounter. And, and the prescription is for two sexual encounters a week. And one partner plans one and the other partner plans the other. And for partners that have low... Um, who have high desire but they don't have a lot of sex, this program guarantees them sex twice a week. And for partners who feel like they're missing some romance and that the sex is not very, you know, romantic or effortful and they want a little more effort, they are guaranteed to kind of exciting, purposeful, planful sexual encounters. Mm. So it tends to work for all kinds of people. And I'm a big fan of planning. Great. Oh, I love it. Great. Thank you. Lots of, uh, you. Lots of food for sex. Not food for mm-hmm, thought. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you, Colette. Do you have any more questions? Okay. I don't want to cut you off. No, that's it. That, that was, was it. So fulfilling. I'm probably going to go home now and, and uh, get back together for my <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and it's perfect timing because we're losing you a little. But thank you very much, Colette, for coming on to the show. <laughs> Thank you. And with your questions, findily, findinghappily.com is how you can find Colette if you're looking for relationship help. Well, Dr. Robin, it is time for that, uh, the music. And, and actually, you're sponsoring this show today with the Guelph uh, Conference. So I'm glad you brought it up before. So we're going to, there's the sound of my music. And we're going to talk about the Guelph Conference. It sounds really fantastic. I unfortunately have a trip planned uh, to Alaska during that time so I won't be meeting you this year but please do tell me a little bit more about what this conference is who should go where it is and all that kind of good stuff Sure. It takes place June 19th and 20th this year. Uh, It's the 36th annual sexuality conference in Guelph, and it's the largest and longest running sexuality conference in Canada. So people come from from all across the country, and we have a real diversity of talks, uh, some focusing on being a a more effective sex educator, but also some uh, more for personal interest about how to have better sex, uh, more pleasure, communicate with partners, um, prevent sexual problems, etc. So we have a wide range of attendees who may be medical professionals or public health nurses or teachers or uh, therapists or students or researchers uh, mm-hmm. or sex educators. So it's a, a broad range of people who are coming. And uh-huh. this year our theme is celebrating family diversity. So we're focusing on all different types of families and uh, and it's a neat and That's really neat great. program. So um, this would be a perfect, I was thinking, for couples for instead of taking a vacation somewhere where you know it's going to be the same old same old this would be a great couples uh retreat (laughs) to learn about things that uh they may not be talking about comfortably but you go to a conference like that and you're certainly gonna have lots of uh things to talk about sexually certainly yeah Yeah. and there's another one that happens in toronto called uh the playground and that might be even a better one for couples who are really interested in enhancing their own sex life um, hmm. I believe that playground happens in the fall and if someone googled playground sex conference in Toronto they would find a lot about it it's an amazing amazing conference with very applied program where you can learn a lot about um, 
how to negotiate the kinds of sexualities you want to have happen in, in your own life and relationship. Great. And they have a great exhibit room where you can purchase all kinds of fun toys at a really good price. Mm. Mm. That's, that's one of the other great things about going to sexuality conferences. The exhibit halls are really interesting. I bet. It's like a, 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 a non-embarrassing way to, instead of, you know, ducking around and seeing if you're going to walk into the rubber tree or, or <laughs> any of the, the pleasure chest or any of the stores around here, you can go to a conference and it's all out there and you get lots to choose from. Mm-hmm. So how do they register? How do people register? They can find out about it at GuelphSexualityConference.ca and Guelph is spelled G-U-E-L-P-H and then SexualityConference.ca. There's no spaces, no capitals, and uh, they can register right on the website. That sounds great. Yes, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Robin and I found out that we were born in the same little tiny hospital in Kitchener-Waterloo, Ontario. So that's kind of cool. I still can't get over that. I found you on Google, and then it turns out we're born at the same hospital. So that's why you're yes. my co-host. It's a neat connection. I'm really glad. Thank goodness for that. Who knows who, who, knows who you might have invited otherwise? Exactly. Exactly. So um, any research that you've been doing that's exciting? What are you working on uh, now? Uh, well, desire is my primary area of interest. I'm very interested in what sparks our desire because it seems like we all want to want more sex, but we're all trying to figure out how to want more sex and how to have it happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, my PhD student, Sarah Murray, is currently doing research on men 30 to 60, mm-hmm. and she's been interviewing them uh, to talk about factors that influence their desire. And so we've been spending a lot of time thinking about actually the ways men and women are similar in terms huh. of factors that enhance their desire. And uh, it'll be very good to get that research out into the world because we have this idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. But yeah. what we're seeing is quite a lot of similarity in terms of the things men, and men talk about enhance their desire and the things women talk enhance, about enhancing, enhancing their desire. I actually had Dr. John Gray on the air with me twice. He came on uh, the show. I don't know if you knew that. So I'll have to tell him there's a third book in there where we're the same. <laughs> yeah. So what would... And it's, better, it's better if we approach things like that, right? If we position ourselves as opposites from the very start, then we're already starting off with a conflict. So mm-hmm. it, I think it's very True. helpful for all of us to think about the ways that we're similar. Because actually the research suggests there's way more overlap between us mm-hmm. and then there are separate distributions for behavior thinking about uh, statistically significant terms so what's the can you give a little sneak preview what it what is one of the mm-hmm. common things that uh, sure. sparks men and women in terms of desire one of the biggest things for both men and women, and we've seen this in a number of studies over the last 10 years, is that feeling desired is really important. So both men and women want to feel like their partner would rather be nowhere else than right there engaging mm. in a sexual uh, activity with them. And we get this we get the sense that maybe feeling attractive or desirable or desired is not as important to men. But the men in uh, Sarah's study talked about how women get this all the time. Women get compliments. Women get approached and initiations mm-hmm. happening for sex quite often. Mm-hmm. And men don't. They really don't get that. And they yearn for a partner initiating sex, a partner giving really? them a compliment. Um, and they really, they want, they don't want to feel like their partner is just, you know, killing time for the next 15 minutes, having sex, waiting for Grey's Anatomy to come on. They really <laughs> want to feel like their partner is into it and wants to be having the sex. And I think sometimes um, some women kind of just do it and they roll their eyes and they say, okay, let's go for it. I'll do it. And right. it kind of takes some of the magic out of it for right. men. Right, right. Well, I, I, and, and, you know, to be fair, when mm. women aren't uh, asked or it really doesn't matter and uh, you know I've been that's a situation where it's like it you know you it really doesn't matter what makes you feel good that was very early on one guy so uh, but but I know that that uh, for many women to and that's why we're doing the show to be able to go yeah i i want to have sex i want to have better sex i want to have orgasms i want to have really good orgasms i want to know what the 9 11 kinds of orgasms there are i want to explore sex i want to uh, uh, feel good about my body i want to look forward to sex as much as he does that yes. that has to start here that has to start with the woman 
being um, having sort of like a, a, a hard reset, <laughs> literally, yes. around her sexuality and what she desires and what she wants, which is why this this is this is such an important topic. And and just to plug um, another conference while we're at it, I'm actually going to be and I asked you to join me, but you were busy <laughs> uh, doing a panel called or a mini not a panel, but a mini session called Breaking the Sex Ceiling. And specifically talking about, I'm bringing, do you know Debbie Ward? She's uh, mm -hmm. one of two individuals in North America who is certified with the uh, seven keys uh, of um, Tibetan tantric sex. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she and I, she, they, they're calling her the... Um, uh, Asian, sorry, the Oprah, I'm the Asian Oprah. They're calling her the <laughs> Oprah of sex. <laughs> so the wow. two of us are doing this session specifically again for, for her to share, uh, what she knows about how to really, uh, put pleasure on steroids for women. And I think that it, it is, it's time. And isn't it wonderful that, uh, we can talk about this and we can, we can help women, with this whole topic. Yes, it is wonderful. And, and I, I love that you're, you're talking about the need for a hard reset and that it, it all just really does start with us. Um, yes. We can't just wait for the greatest sex to magically appear. Mm -hmm. um, we have to take responsibility to figure out the kind of sex we want and then figure out ways to create this in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does start with us. It's too much pressure to put on our partners to create this incredible, fantastic, orgasmic sex. And we have to think about ourselves as deserving it. We deserve the great sex. Yes. It's good for us. It's good for our relationships. And we yes. have to privilege it and make it a priority. And this is way easier said than done. And it's something I still mm -hmm. struggle with on a daily basis and I'm sure you do too but yeah it's, it's a goal to work towards yeah because I, I I was just um saying to a girlfriend of mine you know there's a part of me it's like this is a lot of work yeah it's, it's not easy and it's and it's like do I really want to and and it's tied to you know I'm not in a relationship now and I don't really feel like dating because I have very little time and, uh, you know, I'm like many women at the end of the day, I just I can't wait to get in my bed alone to mm -hmm. to to really mm -hmm. feel the I love the, the, the feeling of my sheets and my bed and the comfort. And yet I know that I that that road of shutting down mm -hmm. my sex life and my love life is not good for me. I know that theoretically, but it is. It has to, I have to work at keeping this open. I have to go on duty dates, as Dr. Pat says. I have to um, be open to the attention and, and actually go out on dates, even if you know, I really don't think there's, there's a point. Because that we're made social animals. We are made to have connections. We're supposed to have the love connections. And we're supposed to have the sexual connections. So I'm, t I'm obviously giving myself a pep talk. Can you tell? <laughs> on the you can just replay this myself. podcast for yourself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you need a boost. I know, I know. Well, we're running against the edge of time on the show and another wonderful, successful episode in the, our series Sexual Healing with Dr. Robin Milhausen and Dr. Marissa. I'm so grateful that we met. I'm so grateful that you're you're here with me and continuing to enlighten my listeners, our listeners, on this series. Um, have a great month, and I will talk to you next month. Thank you. These are some of the funnest hours I have all month, so I'm oh, already looking forward to the next one. Yay! <laughs> Do have a great one. All right, and here's okay. your 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 affirming applause. Wow. Yeah, that this is the fastest time for my shows too. Although I, I my all my shows I never I never seem to have enough time. But it is time for our final uh, coming up to the balance bar. Join me at my balance bar. I am giving away, yes, uh, the Asian Oprah Strikes Again, giving away more free tickets valued at $125 per ticket to the fantabulous California Women's Conference, May 19th and 20th at the Long Beach Convention Center. Ariana Huffington, Jack Canfield, Gina Davis, Bob Proctor, uh, the Hendricks, great sex educators, um, 
I know I'm forgetting someone. Uh, I, uh, Michelle Patterson, my mate and friend. Uh, we were on NBC Smart Money Talk Radio together uh, last week. At, uh, uh, we were honored on a um, Women Making a Difference series. Shout out to uh, the Conaways and to Mr. Strategy. It was a great interview. If you missed it, please uh, go to my website. There's a link there. But uh, four free tickets the first four to email me or sign my guest book on my website, the number four, balance.org, will get those free tickets. So that's the conference. Um, Sedona, you have two more days to save $300 to join me in the beautiful vortexes of Sedona, Arizona, and learn some uh, balanced tools to get rid of that critic in your head and also to learn balanced Tai Chi Gong, the moving meditation for peace in your heart, one breath at a time. Next Tuesday, it is, uh, I get to be Dr. Marissa, the kinder, gentler Dr. Laura. We have three men lined up to ask how they can be more balanced in their lives. So you won't want to miss it. Tune in at Naturally High Noon for Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa Pay. That's P for positive, E-I. And remember, it's all about balance. Peace in and peace out. Hello.